Our sermon text for this morning is taken from Paul's second letter to Timothy, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Paul writes, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier in Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive the share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. This is the end of our reading. When my daughter was one year old, I bought a jogger stroller so that she could go running with me in the mornings. Well, actually, truth be told, so that she could ride along while I went running in the mornings. And if you're not familiar with the jogger stroller, those are the ones that have the big wheels, the bicycle wheels, and they have, uh, uh, this one had a, a strap that attached to my wrist and a handbrake so that even if I bit it, I wouldn't lose control of the stroller. And uh, it had a kind of a aluminum cage that surrounded her to keep her safe and a seat belt. And I added a blanket and a snack and a drink and her favorite toy and, of course, the diaper bag. And I did all of this so that we could spend time together in the morning. And it turned something that was an endurance exercise into something that was a source of enjoyment for both of us. In fact, when she was five years old, she had outgrown the stroller. She could barely squeeze her into it. And yet she still wanted to ride along in the morning when I went running because it, it really was a source of, of joy to spend that time together. Now, uh, full disclosure, she's going to be turning 24 this week. And she is learning that while most of childhood is involved with uh, enjoyment, most of adulthood, or at least a large part of it, has to do with endurance. But that doesn't mean that we can't find joy even in the hardships, even in the things that we are enduring. Which brings me to our text for this week, in which Paul encourages Timothy to endure everything. And he uses three metaphors that I want to focus on this morning. Uh, three metaphors for this endurance that he encourages us to have as part of spiritual maturity. And the first one is this. He says, like soldiers... We endure hardship to please our superior. Paul, when he writes this, is chained up in a, a dungeon. Uh, many scholars believe that he was in the Mamertine prison in Rome. This was a, a dark, cold, brutal dungeon in which he was chained to the wall. It was, it was a far cry from the house arrest that we read about at the end of the book of Acts, from which he wrote some of his other letters. This was at the end of his life, in a, in a prison where if his friends didn't bring him food, he would starve to death because they didn't supply meals. And if his friends didn't bring him a, a cloak or a blanket, he, he would possibly freeze to death or die of exposure because they didn't supply that either. He was literally chained for the sake of the gospel. And so this gives some credibility when Paul writes to Timothy and says, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. 
I have to tell you that whenever I read that verse, I'm reminded of a story that I heard years and years ago when I had the opportunity to hear a, a woman named Elizabeth Elliot speak. She told about when she was in college at Wheaton College, she was uh, attracted to a very handsome young man who was also a student there. Uh, not only was he good looking, but he shared her passion for Christian mission. And so one day, I think after class, she slipped him a note that asked, would you like to go out on a date with me? And after chapel, he passed her a note back that had a, a scripture reference on it. And she couldn't wait to get back to her dorm in order to read, look up and read the scripture reference to see what his reply was. And his reply was 2 Timothy 2.4. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Now, if you know the name Elizabeth Elliot, you know that uh, she and her, her husband, uh, future husband Jim, both ended up missionaries in Ecuador. They did get married. They, they had a daughter there. But three years later, Jim Elliot joined some of his friends, four other missionaries who wanted to reach the Alca people. And so they flew a plane and landed on a riverbed to reach this, this reclusive, violent tribe that had not been reached with the Christian gospel. And they, they waited for the Alka to come to them. And sure enough, the Alka people came to them and speared them to death. And Elizabeth Elliot, the widow of Jim Elliot, uh, and another widow named Rachel Saint, they stayed in Ecuador. They did not return to the United States. They continued to work with the Chiqua people with whom they were working and, uh, and keep their children there. And one day, uh, a woman came into their community who had actually lived with the Alka and spoke the Alka language. And she taught uh, Elizabeth and, and Rachel what she knew of the Alka language. And long story short, the widows of Steve, of Steve Saint and uh, uh, Jim Elliott both went to live with the Alka people along with their children. They went to live with this tribe that had murdered their husbands, the fathers of their children, in order to spread the Christian gospel. And some years ago when I was living in Portland, I got to hear the other side of this story from one of the Alka elders who had traveled to the United States in, in order to promote a film about this, these events. And he was speaking and telling us what a difference the Christian gospel made in his life and in the, the life of his tribe, that these people would come to him not seeking vengeance for the murder of their husbands and fathers, but rather to share the Christian gospel, the grace of Jesus Christ with them. And, and that this gospel had revolutionized his life. And now this tribe that was known for its violence was known as a peacemaking tribe that, that would actually resolve disputes between other tribes. It, it just changed everything. And this Alka elder was one of those who had personally been involved in the murder of these missionaries, and yet his translator was Steve Saint, the son of one of those murdered missionaries who had grown up with this tribe. And it was incredibly moving, and it was a reminder of the power of the Christian gospel. And I mention that not because any of us are likely to have our spouses or parents murdered, uh, speared to death for the Christian gospel, but you and I are very likely at times to face hardships which we have no control over, which are not the will of God. It was not the will of God that these men should be murdered. It was not the will of God that Paul should be imprisoned. But we don't have a choice in, in those events many times. What we do have a choice in is how we respond. Whether we choose to seek vengeance because we've been hurt so badly or to withdraw uh, to a place where we're more comfortable or whether we continue to seek the will of our superior, our commander uh, of Jesus Christ, that we lean forward, that we share continually the gospel, not just with our words, but with our actions. We all face 
these decisions. And Paul urges Timothy and us to remember who it is that we serve, that we serve Jesus Christ, the one who intentionally came to earth in order to suffer, to, to live a perfect life in our place and offer himself as an offering, facing beating and crucifixion and humiliation and mockery out of love for us so that our sins would be forgiven, so that we would be pardoned and reconciled to God. He went to the cross and died in order to break the power of death over us. And you and I, who call ourselves Jesus followers or Christians, you and I have this Christ as our Savior and also our Lord, the one who has a will for our lives, for how we respond to hardship. And, and so, like soldiers, we endure hardship to please our superior. The second image that Paul uses is this. Like athletes, we strive with integrity to win the victory. Paul goes on to say, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. You know, and I read this this past week, I, I couldn't help think, but think of Lance Armstrong, the American cyclist who won an amazing seven Tour de France bicycle race victories. And yet following those victories, the evidence mounted and mounted that he had uh, used uh, doping, uh, that is, uh, drugs and, and, and techniques that were not allowed in order to complete these victories. And so his, his championships, his titles, his wins of the Tour de France were stripped of him, uh, as was his reputation. And this is what Paul is reminding Timothy and us of. The world encourages lying and cheating and even violence in order to accomplish our personal goals, whatever we want to do. But part of adulthood, spiritual adulthood included, is discovering that there are no shortcuts in the things that matter. In other words, you can use performance enhancing drugs to win a victory in sports, but you will eventually be found out and lose your title and reputation. You can practice fornication, as many people seem to believe now, and, and that that will somehow improve your sex life. But the reality is, in the long term, it actually decreases your ability to have complete intimacy with your partner, with your spouse. It actually destroys, in many cases, your chance for forming a stable family, for having successful parenting. You can use politicking and bullying in order to force people to your will to try to legislate morality. But in the end, those things will poison your soul and they will alienate people from Christianity. The fact is, mature Christian faith realizes that we have to do the hard work, the hard work of loving people, even people who hurt us, even people who are, are different from us, even people who attack us. We have to do the hard work of loving them in order to demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Mature faith knows that we have to speak the truth, not everything that we hear, not even things that are passed along by friends, but the truth that we actually know to be the truth. That is those things that we have personally experienced and what the Bible has revealed to us and nothing else in order to spread the Christian gospel. Those who are Christians who are mature realize that we may have to endure rejection for the sake of Jesus Christ, but we don't resort to means other than those which Christ has given us, which involves loving people and speaking the truth, because only those things can grow Christ's kingdom. Like athletes, we strive with integrity to share in this victory. The third image that Paul uses is this. Like farmers, we look forward to a harvest in the future. Paul says the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. This passage, I think, is often misunderstood, and I think I originally misunderstood it to mean if you do good and work hard, you will have material blessings in this life. 
But look at the context. We look at how Paul follows this up. He says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, a word he uses to mean those who have come to believe in Jesus. I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that's in Jesus Christ. In other words, what's this harvest that the Bible consistently talks about? It's not material possessions. It is God's gathering in the souls of those who have come to trust in him, who have been redeemed and reconciled with him. This is consistently what the Bible uses the term harvest for. And it consistently tells us that the seed is God's word, the message of salvation that God has given to us, what he has revealed to us. And and this seed is germinated by the Holy Spirit of God that creates faith. And you and I, we are the farmers. We're the farmers. We're the ones who are called to spread that seed, to spread that word. My older brother was a farmer for almost a decade in central Washington, dry land, wheat. And I know from his experience that farmers don't have a choice about the weather. They don't get to choose what the weather does and how the seasons play out. And they don't get to choose the crop prices after the harvest. But what they do get to decide is how much seed to spread and when to plant it and how to nurture that seed and how to harvest that seed. And this is the image that Jesus uses of Christians growing his kingdom. That is to say that we have to have great trust in this cooperative effort with God because there are so many things we can't control. We can't force people to accept Christ as their savior. But what we can do is spread the word. We can plant the seed. We can pray for the Holy Spirit to germinate that seed. And sometimes we get the opportunity to be involved in the harvest. That is, we get the opportunity to bring people to the point where where they trust Christ, where they are baptized into his family, where where they've reached this point. And, And it's a great joy that we get to share in that, that we get uh, uh, to be among the first to experience that harvest. I uh, have uh, twice now in my life bought houses that were pretty much unlandscaped and I have planted gardens, that is fruit trees and berry bushes and various other fruiting plants that I then sold the house to someone else (laughs) when these gardens were maturing. And the last time I did this was a house I had in Coeur d'Alene. Among the plants that I planted were a grapevine that I nurtured for a decade, never produced grapes until a week before I moved out. I uh, had sold the house and I went outside in the backyard and noticed that on the grapevine were these clusters of beautiful grapes. And I tasted one and, and they were sweet and delicious. And I thought, What a blessing for this family that has bought this house. A a nice couple with their children. They're really going to enjoy this garden that I planted for them. (laughs) But, you know, this is sometimes the way that it is. We have the opportunity to plant seeds and we never see the harvest. We never get to enjoy the fruit of the labor. But it's still a joy because you and I are passing on to future generations the good news of, of Jesus Christ. We're passing on to future generations the the joy of having a relationship with God and and being in a vibrant, living church as as what's called the bride of Christ. And this is the joy that causes us to endure, to endure when when there are hardships, when there are conflicts within the church and, and outside of the church. There's joy in working cooperatively with God in growing his kingdom and looking forward to this harvest when Jesus comes back. And this is how faith endures when we're the ones doing the running and pushing the the stroller, not the ones riding in it. When we mature in our faith, we focus on Jesus, the one who endured the cross for us. In fact, one of my favorite passages is Hebrews 12, 2, where where the author says, focus uh, on Jesus, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. 
And I think there was no joy in being crucified. This was a horrific death. But the joy set before him was the joy of knowing that through his death, we would be redeemed. We would be welcomed into his kingdom. This was the joy. And so we fix our eyes on Jesus. We focus our lives on him who is our commanding officer, our superior, on him who is our inspiration as, as athletes to endure and to continue to do good and, and not resort to worldly means to pursue heaven's goals. We fix our eyes on Jesus who will return as we seek to be part of that harvest of souls. In Jesus' name, amen.